morning, everyone. Today for Alia Graphic Novels and Comics, I'm chatting with James Foley. James is author and illustrator of the S Tinker Inc. series of graphic novels, as well as illustrating Topple Towers, My Dead Bunny, The Last Viking, and many more. Uh, James has been nominated and shortlisted and won numerous awards, including winning the 2015 West Australian Young Readers Hoffman Award for The Last Viking Returns and was a finalist in both the 2016 and 2017 Aurealis Awards for Graphic Novel category. Welcome, James. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's really good to have you. Um, do you know much about what the Alia Graphic Novels and Comics Group do? I, I can, I've just been imagining, I suppose. <laughs> I haven't read a, like a, a distinct manifesto or anything, but I imagine that you're a collection of librarians who are into graphic novels. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And I think the main goal for our group is to try and promote Australian creators to libraries to get as many um, Australian works in Australian libraries being read by kids and adults alike. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you for doing that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to get started, could you tell us a little bit about how you got your start creating comics and graphic novels? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I was always sort of making comics as a kid. Um, when we made a school newspaper in, I think, grade seven, um, people said, you probably want to be one of the editors, right? Because I, I think they, they could see that I was, I was okay with words. But I was probably more bossy than anything. Um, but I said, no, I want to be one of the cartoonists. I want to do some cartoons, please. Um, I've been reading a lot of strip cartoons, um, little comic strips. My dad had collections of foot rock flats and political cartoons on the bookshelves at home. So I'd pour through those as a kid. Michael Looney cartoons as well. Um, then I started get, to get into Asterix comics um, from school. Um, and then I started just trying to make my own. So school newspapers, high school newspapers, university newspapers, I was making little comics here and there for fun. Um, but then when I was getting into publishing, my first book was not a comic book, it was a picture book um, called The Last Viking. And it wasn't until I'd done about five or six books that I sort of felt like I was confident enough to try tackling um, a story that had a lot more pictures in it, a little junior graphic novel. And that was published in 2016, and that was called Brobot. That was the first in my S Tinker Inc. series. And so then it went from there. Now I've done four of those. Um, they've got longer and longer and more complicated as they've gone. Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I can do another one after this, yeah. if I've got the energy, the stamina. <laughs> it seems like you're doing quite well. Um, so I'm guessing this was always your dream career then, if you've been doing it since primary school. Um, your works are really popular in library schools and everywhere else from what I can see. How did you initially market your work to libraries and schools? Or, and what advice would you give to other Australian creators trying to do the same thing? Sure. Um, initially, I didn't market at all. I didn't even sort of understand how that worked or what I needed to do I just I didn't have a clue I was just a, a kid really um uh in my late 20s but still very much a kid and just trying to figure out how to make a book for the first time um and just riding the wave of of how that works um and so I've been learning on the job as I've gone so part of my advice would be just to learn as much about this career as possible before you get published um it's a lot easier to to plan out your career if you're if you know a lot about it before you get published um i um see i didn't start with the comic i started with a picture book and i was really lucky that my first picture book was was shortlisted for the early childhood book of the year in the children's book council book week awards that year in 2012 um so that just got my work a lot of exposure through that um, you can't guarantee that that will happen with your first book though. So that was just a lucky sort of break. Um, so what you can do instead uh, is just get involved in all the professional networks. That's a really important thing. I got involved in the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators here in WA, um, the SCBWI. And we've got a great chapter here in Western Australia, but there's chapters all around Australia and they run professional development um, events and um opportunities to meet publishers and editors from from publishing houses too so they're a great mob to get in contact with another really good one though is um the children's book council of australia they've got chapters in most states i'm pretty sure and our wa chapter again is fantastic 
and they're very supportive of everybody, um, all the creators here, particularly in ways um, helping us network with librarians in public libraries and in school libraries. So every year here in WA, they run a thing called A Night With Our Stars, which is basically kind of like a, a speed dating sort of uh, scenario um, for anyone who's had a book published in the last year to then give a quick little spiel to a room full of librarians and teachers who are into children's books. So a lot of people, when they're getting their name out there to start with, it's through that event. And there's, there's similar sorts of events in other states around Australia too. So get in contact with your local CBCA and um, your local SCBWI and find out what events are on. And then you can network through there. You can meet publishers, editors, librarians, teachers. Um, and then before you know it, word of mouth will sort of take it from there. You produce material primarily aimed at children. Has there been a time when you've considered producing material for bigger kids? How old? How old are these bigger kids? Big like us. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's never occurred to me, ever. No? No, never, ever, ever. I've always just wanted to make books um, for kids and to read to read stuff that's, that's aimed at sort of younger people. I mean, if I don't read a lot of novels. Um, I don't read a lot of literary novels or anything. I do occasionally, but mostly... Um, my to be read pile just keeps growing and growing. But then if I get a new graphic novel, I'll read that straight away. It won't go in the yeah. pile, I'll just read it. So yeah, my, my tastes are very much graphic novels for all ages, whether that's real, real young stuff or it's older stuff. Um, and then in terms of books, it's very much picture books and, and middle grade novels. I don't, I don't read a lot of the older stuff. <laughs> but I, I never say never. Maybe if I have an idea and I feel confident enough to do it, but I think I'll leave that to the people much more talented than I am. In that I way. like that your humour is, um, it crosses all ages anyway. I think it's that good sort of humour that you get in a good, a good Disney film where the adults get it and the kids get it and everyone's amused by it. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I always just sort of just try to aim at my, my humour level, which is very much sort of eight seven eight nine year olds <laughs> and then just throw in a couple of jokes that maybe they won't get until they're a little bit older but aren't mm. rude they're just a little fun just over the <laughs> um awesome when you start a new book I, I know that you're mostly working on a series at the moment but when you start something new do you start with a story idea or with a character or illustration idea um it can be a little bit of everything um, it can be just a bit nebulous at the start, really. It's sort of this big unformed um, thing. I've sort of got inklings of story, but nothing concrete yet. And I've got inklings of characters that have been sort of just showing up in a sketchbook, really. Um, and, and usually there's a character that will just sort of stay in the sketchbook and will keep popping up and they won't leave. And it's almost like they're saying, find me a story, please. I need to like, I need to get out of this sketchbook and onto, into another book. Um, so yeah, generally... I'll sort of have some sort of character who turns up in a sketchbook. I'll try them in a couple of different scenarios. Then some sort of image will appear in the sketchbook that, that gives the indication of the direction of the story. Um, and then I'll go, okay, cool. That's all right. I'll figure that out now. I'll start writing some words. I might do a couple more pictures, a couple more words, a couple more pictures. They'll bounce off each other for a while until the words sort of solidify into a story that makes sense from, from where to go. And then, um, then I can start sketching the whole thing out properly as well. So how long would it take you to produce one of your graphic novels like Gastronauts or even to illustrate something like The Last Viking? Um, well, every book takes a different amount of time. So yeah, The Last Viking, um, for anyone who's watching the YouTube, this one here, The Last Viking was my first picture book. And I, was, I still had a part-time job at the time and I was still working out how to even make a picture book at the time. Um, so that one took me about a year and a half to work on part-time. Wow. That so that's, that's pretty long as far as picture books go. But I mean, if you took all the time that I was working on it and smushed it, it mm. would have been, it, it probably would have been about a year still anyway, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was just, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so I was really learning on the job. But then with the graphic novels that I've done... Um, Brobot was the first one. That one probably took me about five or six months, I think, maybe less. But then Dungzilla and um, Gastronauts, the next two, um, they were longer books and they were more complicated. Um, 
they they probably took me about a year each, but I wasn't working on it full time. Um, then Chicken Saurus, the one that's just come out um, last week, this one's the longest by far. Uh, it's almost twice as long as as Brobot. Much more story, many more characters involved. That one I've been working on and off. The very first ideas in my sketchbook turned up in 2016. Oh, wow. So the first ideas turned up four years ago. So I'm never working on one book at a time. I'm usually juggling multiple things. Mm. Um, but yeah, I can be working on a book from anywhere between uh, a year and four or five years. Crazy. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> do you spend <laughs> much time revising your work after, like once you've gotten to the end, do you go back a lot and second guess yourself? Um. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's always some revising and editing in the process anyway. That's important. Yeah. So say with like Chicken Saurus, I, I wrote the whole thing out as a script first, which was about 8,000 words, about 30 pages just of text. And then I um, did tiny, tiny thumbnail sketches for the whole book. And that took me about two weeks. And then I did bigger, more detailed roughs for the whole book. And that took me about a month or two. And then I did all the finals and that took me about three months. Wow. <laughs> Two or three months. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're revising as you go through each mm. step of the process. Constantly. You're you're figuring out better ways of doing things. Um, but then once the book is published, you yeah, I can't help but actually flick through it again. And you always find at least one mistake every time. <laughs> and yeah. um, some, <laughs> sometimes it's your fault and you kick yourself and sometimes it's someone else's fault. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's all printed or whatever. Um, you just fix it in the second print run if you get ah, it. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's always something to revise and you just got to learn to let it go and sort of relax, move on with the next project. Know that it's going to be awesome, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> um, your website, it's really good. I really like your website. It's very informative. Thank you. It's very interactive. It's clever. It's funny. Do you manage it yourself or do you have a helper? I, I do manage it myself. Wow. Um, well done. Yes. Um, oh, it's, it's not too hard. It's just I use I use WordPress. It's pretty straightforward. I've sort of picked up a lot of uh, just the, just the, as much HTML and CSS as I need over the years um, from making my own websites. Um, I do all my own social media organizing stuff as well. And um, it's a lot of work. So I probably need a personal assistant. It definitely um, sounds like you do. That is a lot of work. <laughs> At some point, yes. I think I'll need to handball some of this stuff and delegate. Um, with, you do a lot of workshops and a lot of school talks. Yes. Have you ever had one of those events end in a less than excellent way? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, most of the time they go pretty well. Now, um, I've been doing talks for just over 10 years now. So I, I sort of know the ropes and the ins and outs and how to make them work swimmingly. But um, occasionally some things happen that are beyond your control. Um, one time, one time I, I was speaking to a large school group and it was from pre-primaries all the way up to grade sixes. And they were in a big hall. Um, and the hall, some school halls uh, are really well set up. They've got a projector in a nice spot and they've got a connection point for all the you know, AV, laptops and whatever else, it's in a nice spot so you can get to everything really easy. But sometimes it's in a really wonky spot. Like the projector is at one end of the hall, but where you plug everything in is it all the way at the other end of the hall. Mm. And I, I don't often use a laptop with a clicker. I often use my iPad. So I need to have it right next to me so I can touch the screen and then I can draw with it and, you know, do whatever I need to do with it. So this one time I had this, this whole school from pre-primaries all the way to grade six is in this hall the floor was bare concrete. It was really cold and kind of echoey. And I had to have a long cable plugging in from where I was standing to connection point on the, on the wall next to me. And unfortunately it was right. It was crossing the door where the classes all have to come in. Um, so I couldn't plug anything in until everyone was inside. And then I had to plug it in. Then I could start talking. And then, um, and then this year one class in the middle of the session says, Oh, we have to go early. <laughs> and there's, they're sitting in the middle of the room and there's doorways at the back of the room. They could have gone out the back doorway, but they decide they all stand up and they all have to leave out the door where the cable is. And so I have to unplug everything. Everyone has to just sit there waiting for this year one class to walk out. And then I plug everything back in and I try to get the energy back again. And then just as I'm trying to get the, the, the audience back together, 
this pre-primary girl starts bawling her eyes out for no reason in the middle of the pre-primary class right at the front, just starts crying. <laughs> oh, no and then all the other kids are looking at her and the teachers don't come and do anything at all. Oh. And then a kid next to that kid starts crying as well. <laughs> and then all these kids are crying for no reason. And it was just <laughs> terrible. It was the worst. So Hilarious though. <laughs> <laughs> I've had another one where um, I was doing a little book launch talk um, with the awesome festival and occasionally you'll get kids who yell things out and usually they just want to say something funny or join in or be a bit cheeky and normally you can sort of you can involve them in some way you can do inclusion control which mm. means that you can't you can't really say off to the naughty corner with you um but you can just involve them until the session's done and then you don't have to deal with them anymore mm. but this one time this kid kept calling out and he kept calling out about angry birds. He was he was obsessed with angry birds. It was his thing. And then and then in the middle of the talk, he just got his chair and just came and sat next to me at the front, put his chair down, and then just went, "Everyone, let me tell you about angry birds." And he was about he was about four years old. And it was it's hilarious in hindsight, but it was so hard at the time. Um, and luckily, we we did okay. We got through it. And his mum came up afterwards and said, "I'm so sorry. Thank you so much." Um, my son, you know, he, he does that sometimes and, and my family, it, this was the only session that my whole family could come to. So thank you so much for, for letting him feel welcome and everything else. And I said, that's okay. No worries. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Needed a bit of a drink after that one. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, could you give a, a brief description or a long description? That's completely up to you. Um, about what you do in your workshops and school talks. Um, yeah that you might run at a library or a school yeah sure I, I mean I I run a bunch of different things um it depends what people want and I'm happy to customize things um a lot of the time if I'm talking to a school group I will talk about how I started and and go all the way back to my first book that I made when I was in pre-primary so my mum and I kept a lot of my early sort of stories and drawings and so I can show kids at pretty much whatever age group they are what my drawings look like at their age and that really helps them, I think, to put things into context. Um, not only do they get to meet someone who makes books, but they can see that when I was a kid, I drew just the same as they do now, or maybe even not as good as they can draw. Um, yeah. That happens quite often. And then they can go, oh, right. So real people make books. And when I grow up, my drawings could look like that too. And maybe I could do that as well. Um, and that's really handy, I think, for kids to see. Um, I'll often go behind the scenes on whatever book I've got out at the moment, whatever's new and appropriate for their age. Mm. Um, so I don't talk about my dead bunny with like kindy kids. <laughs> um, if anyone hasn't read that one, it's a picture book about a rabbit that comes back from the dead as a zombie. So it's a picture book for older readers. It's not, it's not going to be read on play school anytime soon. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll do that sort of thing. Um, we can do drawing in, in there as well. Kids can throw out suggestions for stuff for me to draw. I can teach them to draw some things. And then we can even just do a drawing workshop instead. So we can learn how to draw basic cartoon facial expressions, cartoon bodies, creating characters. Um, often we do little clay sculpture workshops where we make 3D models of our characters. We just did some of those with the awesome festival um, here in Perth. And um yeah, sometimes we even get to make a picture book in a day. So that means uh, I'll come to a school in about five hours with a small group of about 20, 25 kids. We will write and illustrate a picture book together. And we just did one of those at the Awesome Festival as well. Um, and that's amazing fun because you have no idea what you're going to come up with. And by the end of the day, every kid has got to contribute to at least one illustration in the book. And there's this story that didn't exist at the start of the day that everyone gets ownership of. So that's one of my favourites to do. Well, that's with. terrific. Mm. Um, this year being an exception, do you get to travel much with work? Yeah, usually. Usually I get to go over east at least once a year. Um, I usually go visit Sydney for at least one week and I try to visit Melbourne for a week. Um, I was supposed to go over about four times this year and mm -hmm. they've all been, they've all been cancelled mm. um, just for safety and everything else. Um, but usually I get to travel within WA uh, at least once as well, um, usually for like a country book week. Um, so this year I got to do 11 days in the southwest of Western Australia. So I got to go all the way down to the south coast, down to 
Denmark and Albany, and then up through Mount Barker and then through some smaller wheat belt towns. Um, so that was great to get out to some smaller places I hadn't been to before and to muck around and do some drawing and tell some stories. Well, that's nice. It's good that you can mm. get out to the more regional areas. It is. But I mean, the good thing about this year too has been that because of all, you know, Zoom and video conferencing, I've been able to talk to kids all over the place. So yeah. I've actually had more um sessions with kids over east and around australia than i ever would um they've just all been virtually like this it's good that it's um this has been a push for people to really improve their technology skills in, in especially in schools i think yes it has and i think it's really good too for people in wa and, and other more you know t cities that are not part of the big smoke of mm. melbourne and, and sydney um schools and, and libraries are suddenly realizing oh we can book anyone from around australia and we're like yeah i mean you always could have but that's fine <laughs> let's 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 do it now yeah um, so it's it's really great for us over here to be able to get a little bit more exposure for our work with all the population that's over east mm, definitely yeah um all right if you couldn't do this job anymore what career path do you think you would take uh, mm. <laughs> um i I studied to be a, a primary teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I got about halfway through the degree and just thought, I don't know how anyone has the energy to do this every day. This is amazing. This is so hard. Um, before that, I thought about, uh, I always loved being in the school library. Um, and I thought about being a librarian as well. I'm not just saying that because this is, you know, um, <laughs> <Poor> librarian. <laughs> the librarians group. But I think, I think, yeah, I think being a teacher librarian or an art teacher, a primary art teacher would be my my other dream jobs probably um or just being a stay-at-home dad yeah that's pretty fun too i imagine yeah <laughs> <laughs> um all right so you've had a really busy week with the release of your new book chicken saurus um you've had those workshops at the awesome arts festival and at school holidays and i imagine your son would love some of your attention um yes. you've also done several interviews including ours how are you going yes. are you okay <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 okay I'm I'm getting exhausted uh it has been a very busy time of the year um my wife is is pregnant too and has morning sickness at the moment oh. as well and has had for the last couple of months so things have been very busy in our in our household oh, I can imagine. um but yeah she's starting to turn the corner now which is good and um yeah it's going to be it's going to be busy for the rest of the year there's a couple of projects to work on um but this is just this time of year. It's always busy this time of year. We just have to get through it <laughs> and start delegating some work. I think that's I just right. Have to start delegating. Yeah. Maybe hire once my son's assistant. old enough to do some coding, then he can work on the <laughs> website for me. Um, I've already asked you, or you've already spoken about what you read. Um, do you think you could recommend two or three graphic novels to our audience? That yeah, sure. What age is good? your audience? Uh, well, our audience is librarians um yep. so maybe a couple of novels that they could put in libraries that you think would be good for kids to get into reading sure um okay so the, i i pulled a stack out to in case you're asking this one home time by campbell white campbell's yes. a mate who lives here in wa and this is an amazing epic incredible story most of you have probably heard of it i hope um the second volume has just come out or is about to come out and the most amazing thing about this apart from the stellar artwork is that Every chapter is in a different illustration style. So at the start, it's just all kind of monochrome, but then it goes to um, uh, a watercolor style. And then it goes to like an animation cell oh, sort gorgeous. of style. And then it goes to um, a clear line sort of Belgian Tintin comic style. And then it goes to a pixel art style. And there's another one here too, I missed. There's one that's painted on linen as well. And it references a lot of paintings from, um, from I think maybe they're from Australia wide, but particularly WA paintings from the time that the Swan River colony was first being set up. So he's referencing a lot of local old paintings in this. So all these different styles are reflecting that each chapter is told by a different character as well. So um, yeah, that's just absolutely phenomenal stuff. It's so good. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, I mm, some of these ones I've picked may not be 
they're probably more like YA comics. That's okay. Um, yeah, so this this series here, um, I can't remember how to say it. <laughs> G-E-I-S. I think it's Gesh. Gesh. It's okay. pronounced Gesh. This series is really incredible art. Um, it's all sort of black and, oh, no, it's all sort of colour on the inside. These amazing lush brush illustrations. Um, and it's a fantasy sort of story. Um, it's phenomenal. I can't really tell you too much about it uh, without giving it away, but you really get drawn into it. And the art is just incredible. It's amazing. Um, this one is hilarious. Adventures of a Japanese Businessman. Oh, I think I've seen that one in our library. By Nobrow Press. Um, this one's a wordless um, graphic novel. And the thing I like about this one is it's, it all kind of scrolls. So this man's walking and then he's still walking and then he's still walking. And so you see all these little stories happen in the background as he walks through the landscape. Um, and it just keeps going and going and going and going with no words. Um, but that same sort of four panel um, layout the whole way through. So it's almost kind of like he's a video game character walking through a video game world in that mm. way. Um, and I wonder if that was kind of an influence. It's really kind of gross in some parts and very, very funny and out there. Um, my absolute favourite graphic novel um, and probably my favourite book of all time is this one called One Soul by Ray Fawkes. Mm -hmm. This one is so unbelievably good. It is telling the story of um, 18 different people's lives at the same time. So you get spreads like this that are three by three grids on, on both pages. And it's telling 18 different people's lives simultaneously from the moment of their birth um, shows you where they all live. Um, but the narrator is kind of, the narrator is kind of this ethereal sort of voice that kind of relates to individual stories, but also all their stories at the same time. So the narrator is kind of the thread that joins all the different stories together. So you start to see these parallels between their lives, similar events happen. It's almost as if you're watching the one life that's been reincarnated 18 different times, three different time periods in history, um, all the way from sort of um, Neolithic sort of times all the way through to the 1980s. Um, and so it's phenomenal. And then the first time someone dies, they don't all die at the same time. Um, one of them dies and then their screen, their little, their little panel goes black. Oh, uh, sad. So yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of amazing. Like one, one, a panel will just go black. I'm a little bit heartbroken for it. Yeah, yeah. But then, I mean, all these characters are going to have to die at some point in their, in their lives. So then mm. more and more panels go black. But then, but then words start coming back through those panels. And eventually it becomes this massive meditation on life and death and what it is to be human and all that really, really deep stuff. So I said, like, I didn't read much literary stuff, but this one. <laughs> it's quite literary. This one is amazing. And... um. It's sort of required reading, I reckon, at least once a year. It, it usually makes me cry by the end of it. It's definitely, um, Art Spiegelman said that graphic novels are books you, they're comics you need to keep a bookmark in. Um, and this one's like that. It's it's just so, it's, it's a real sort of brain exercise having to follow 18 different stories at the same time, but, yeah. um, but it's worth it. And he did another one called The People Inside. Mm which uses a similar format, except this time, instead of focusing on individual lives, it's focusing on relationships. So each panel has two people in it, except for um, these ones down here, which are two separate people who haven't met yet. Um, and so each panel is telling the story of a relationship and it's got some good LGBTIQA um, representation in there too, which is good. Um, and then if a couple breaks up, then their panel splits into two. And then maybe a couple next to them might split up here as well. And then, and then if two other people join up, then they start forming a panel together in the middle instead. And then those oh. two people are single. So it's using the comic structure to so help creative. tell the story. It's, it's incredible. It's amazing. These ones, yeah, they're just brilliant. They're some of my favorites. Thank you so much. That's right. What's next for you? Obviously, a baby's on the way. Um, so yeah. I mean, that's going to be a focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you yes. have any more 
books on the burner coming up soon or are you taking a break for a while? I can't take a break yet because I do have some more that I've got to finish. Um, <laughs> there's two kind of major projects that I've got to finish off. Um, one is another uh, shorter comic, um, as well as those four um, S Tinker Inc. comics that I've done with Sally Tinker. I've also done one comic serialization um, with them, just a shorter comic that appeared on the back pages of the school magazine last year. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm doing another one for them that'll appear on their books next year. Um, and that'll feature um, Sally's friend, Charlie, um, who's the, the redheaded girl down here. Um, she'll be sort of the main driver of that one, but Sally will still be in it. And they're going on an underwater mission to find uh, the Kraken. Uh, and it's called Get Kraken. So that should be fun. Nice. Um, so I've got to finish that one. And I'm making a picture book as well. Um, I've got a picture book to do about the history of animals in space travel. Um, which I'm writing as well. So the deadline is coming up really quick and um, I've got to get onto that. <laughs> Will that be in next year's Children's Book Awards? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I hope so. I would love <laughs> that if it did, but I've got to get it done by the deadline um, for, for it to be out in time. <laughs> well, I hope it is. If it is, we'll definitely buy it for the library. Multiple copies, I'm sure. Thank you. That would be wonderful. That's okay. Thank you so much for meeting with me today um, and giving us all this great information for our group. No worries. Um, Thanks for having us, Melody. I appreciate it. That's okay. I can't think of anything else to say, but thanks. Big clap for you. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>